Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We are glad that you're here this morning. I'm, I'm excited to uh, remind us of an upcoming event that's coming on August 3rd. It is going to be uh, a great opportunity for us to serve this community. It's called our Back to School Bash, where our plan, our goal is to give away uh, 500 backpacks of school supplies to kids in our community who are in need of that. And uh, we, we need you to be involved. And I, I want to just tell you, first of all, thank you for your generosity. We set a goal of, of trying to get $7,500 uh, raised for this event. Uh, and you and Faith have responded generously. We have just a little over $8,000 at this point, and we praise God for that and are very thankful for that. Um, there are some, some very specific things uh, that you can do, though, on, on that day, August 3rd. And our desire, our goal is to have 100 volunteers uh, that are going to be helping and serving during this day. Uh, the event is going to start at 8 a.m. on that Saturday morning. And uh, folks, hopefully, will start arriving uh, at that time, and uh, we are, are going to just begin serving them. Uh, there's going to be these, these different opportunities for you. We've actually had a team that's gone through and said, okay, we need this many people to do this, and, and the, the total is 100. Now, we have over 500 people in this room, uh, and we're, we're asking, we would love for all 500 to participate, but we're asking at least for 100 volunteers, and here's some of the things that we need on that day. Uh, traffic logistics, we're, we're looking at having seven volunteers that are just going to be focused on getting people in our parking lot uh, and getting them where they need to go and where they need to park. Uh, so if you're interested in that, keep that in mind. We need 10 traffic greeters, uh, which are folks that are just going to be in the parking lot greeting folks when they get here. You go to their car, uh, you greet them. So if you're a salesman uh, and you like talking to people that you don't know, this is a great opportunity for you to get involved um, and go and meet them personally at their car and, and help walk them into uh, where we're having the event. There's also going to be a prayer tent uh, where we need uh, 20 volunteers. And uh, one of the things that we want to do on this day is as folks come into the parking lot, is just let them go immediately to the prayer tent. We're not going to force them or twist their arm, but we just want them to know that, hey, we want to pray over them. And Robert Reed, our prayer ministry leader, is going to be directing that effort. Uh, so if you say, hey, that's something that I want to be involved in, uh, you're going to have an opportunity to do that. Uh, there's going to be inflatables there, and we need, uh, we need folks to monitor and crowd control the inflatables. Uh, so we need eight people to do that. If that's something that you're interested in, um, not playing on the fl uh, inflatables, but, but <laughs> monitoring the inflatables for the kids to play on the inflatables. Uh, I see some of you guys that... I thought thinking that you're going to get on there. And you may, you may have an opportunity to get on there, but, but the main point is for you to monitor and control. Uh, we need six folks to just handle refreshments. We're not going to be serving a meal on this day, but we do want to keep folks hydrated since it is toward the, the, the hottest part of the summer. So bottled waters and some snacks and stuff. So if you're interested in serving refreshments, we need some folks to do that. Uh, gym greeters are just folks that are going to be in the gym after they funnel through the prayer tent. They're going to go into the gym uh, where they're going to register and we just need some folks to, to be there and to greet folks coming into our gym. Uh, registration table, we need five, nine folks at the registration table that are actually going to register the kids coming in and then you have an opportunity to also give them uh, their backpack as well um, and like I said that backpack is going to be full of supplies for their school year. Uh, we need seven people to paint faces uh, some of your lifelong dreams has to been, have, it's been to be a face painter. This is your time. Uh, so, so rise up and become a face painter in the name of Jesus. Uh, and you can do that uh, this, this on August 3rd. This can be one of your, one of your gifts. Uh, we need floaters in the gym who are just monitoring and directing the flow of traffic. We need six people to do that. Uh, nursery workers, we are going to provide, try to provide child care for our volunteers uh, so that they can serve. 
Uh, so if you are interested in just providing some child care for our volunteers that day, uh, then this is, this is where you need to be. Uh, first aid station, we need two folks uh, to, uh, to be a part of the first aid station. So if, if, if you have uh, experience in putting on a Band-Aid and some Neosporin, uh, this, is, this is your time, two folks to do that. Uh, general floaters are just folks that are stationed at each door and throughout the lobby and restrooms. We need just 15 general floaters who are, who are uh, uh, going to be committed to just kind of making sure that things are, are flowing uh, well, so it's going to be an exciting day. The, the day's going to crank up at eight o'clock. Uh, we're going to be done at eleven thirty. The last thing that we're going to do, uh, the folks are going to come to the gym, get the backpacks. Uh, we're, we're scheduled to have a couple barbers here. They're going to be cutting hair for the kids. Uh, we're scheduled to have some folks doing some medical examinations for the kids. Uh, of course, the face painting and all that will be going on. Uh, but uh, the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to just gather and just have a time of worship. And we're going to encourage uh, all the kids and families who are, who are coming to, to stay till 11 o'clock. Or we're just going to have a brief time of worship and praise. And so that'll be at 11. Then we'll, we'll close the day down at 1130. So 8 to 1130 uh, is the time frame. Um, that just kind of gives you a picture of what the day looks like. Uh, we're going to have those sign-up sheets in the foyer. So right after service, if you saw one of those things, yeah, I think that's, that's something I like to do, or that's my gift, that's my talent. Uh, I want to encourage you to go out there and sign up under that particular category. Uh, we're also going to be sending this around. If you're on our email chain, uh, you will be getting this in, in, in a form where you can sign up online. Uh, we'll be sending that around uh, tomorrow or one day this week. Uh, so really excited about this event. It's going to be great. Uh, most of all, I want you to be praying uh, for this event. Let's just do that right now. Uh, God, we thank you that you have gifted us with the opportunity to serve. Father, we realize that our ministry is a gift of your grace. And so, Father, as, as we prepare to uh, be your hands and feet to this community on August 3rd, Father, I pray that you will just uh, raise up workers in the harvest, uh, Father, to fulfill those duties that need to be fulfilled. And, Father, we just pray that uh, you will bring the families and the kids uh, to us that, that, Father, that need uh, these supplies and that we can serve them in that way. Uh, Father, we also want to serve them through the power of prayer, uh, Father, through the, the love language of just a hug or a smile, uh, and just to let them know that, you know what, we, we care about this community. We're not perfect up here on this hill by any means, uh, but we want to show the love of Christ uh, in any way that we can, and we believe that this is an event that will allow us to do that. So, Father, we pray your blessing on it. We know that you've already blessed us with the funds that we needed, and we thank you for that. We praise you for that. Uh, what an awesome thing, and just be with us as we uh, approach that day, and may it be honoring and glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm very excited. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to pull those out and be turning to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we are, have been in a series that uh, I have entitled, Who Am I?, where we have been exploring what our identity is uh, in Christ and uh, I want to let you know that I am I'm glad to, to teach the Bible, and it is uh, a great honor and privilege to me. And Homewood, I want you to know that this series is not just about information. If you've taken these past 13 weeks that we've been walking through this great letter from our brother, Paul, and, and you've just been collecting information um, I, I think that, that we're missing the point if that's as far as we're getting because this, this series is not as much about information as it is about transformation. And, and what, is, what is God doing in you? Students, what is God doing in you? How is he working through you? What is he transforming your heart to be about? Uh, you know, families, parents, senior adults, single adults, what, what is God doing in you by reminding you who you are, or maybe for the first time, telling you who you are? I mean, we have folks telling us who we are every day, and God has reminded us and told us who we are in Christ, and, he's, and through Paul, he has just been pounding this in our, in our brains and in our hearts these past 13 weeks. And I've got to be honest with you today, we're, we're in chapter 4 and, and find verse 17 there in Ephesians, but I have to be honest with you today, I wish this text wasn't in there. Can I, can I be honest with you? 
You know, a lot of times we think that, oh, well, the, the preacher, you know, he, he masters these texts and then he, he does them all perfectly. And, and if that's the preacher you're looking for, I've just got to be honest with you today, that's not me. This is one of those texts that I, I honestly just, I wish it wasn't in the Bible. I wish it wasn't there. Um, it has been one that is, I've, I've confessed to you before that, that these texts, they work on me just as much as anybody. And, and as I proclaim the word, I, I pray that I will do that faithfully today. I pray that I will do that um, in, in a way that exalts Jesus Christ. But this is one that, that I just wish wasn't in there. Can I say that? I just wish it wasn't in there. You have any texts like that that you come across in the, in the Word of God? And you just, you know, wow, just, just wish that one wasn't there. This is one of those for me. And here's what it says. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility, the futility of their thinking. I want, I want you to just pause right there and just, you know, here, here Paul, just a few verses earlier in, in chapter 4, verse 1, he has said, walk. In your NIV translation, it says live, but probably a more appropriate translation, as we said last week, is to, to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling that you have received. And then he comes to verse 17 and he says, but don't walk like the Gentiles do. In the futility of their thinking now immediately some of you are going to think well i don't think that's a very big deal preacher because our minds are, are futile you're gonna think well I, I don't think that that you know that's not such a problem but because our minds are futile well I, I studied this book i read this book it was written by an author whose mind is futile but i talked to my friends and my friends told me that your friends minds are futile That's very offensive. I don't, I don't apologize for that. I'm just making a point. That's very offensive. And the futility of their thinking. And something else that's even more offensive is that what if we took that verse 17 and we said, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Americans do. Wait a minute, preacher. On the 4th of July week, you're going to stand up there in the pulpit and tell me not to live as the Americans do? That's unconstitutional. But this is that, that offensive language that the readers were hearing from Paul. Don't live as the Gentiles live. He goes on in verse 18 to continue this thought. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. Get this phrase. With a continual lust for more. Are you catching why, why this text has been working on me this week? And are you catching why I'm, I'm wishing that it, it wasn't in here? And are, I want you to know that if you're taking notes in your worship guide and those blank lines for you to take notes, we're not going to go through it today, but if you want to read an exposition on this particular passage, go to Romans chapter 1, read verses 18 through 32 sometime this week. I want to, I want to challenge each of you to do that this week. Romans 1, 18 through 32. It's kind of an exposition on, on this particular text, but let's go on. Verse 20, You, however, did not come to know Christ that way, Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self 
created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Here's the question this morning. What is the new self? What is the new self? I want to ask you, is if you were to describe your identity or you were to describe the, this church's identity, what would you say this week? If someone came up to you at work and said, you know what, tell me about your church. What, what would you say? How would you begin describing it? Well, we, we meet at the corner of Oxmoor and Lakeshore. We've got a building up there, and it's, it's being renovated right now. It's actually pretty cool. I, I sit on such and such pew every week. How would you begin describing the identity of this church? Would you begin talking about a worship style? Would you begin talking about the people? How would you begin describing the identity of the church? And what I want us to do, church, is think through even just the past 13 weeks as Paul has been unpacking our identity. What has he been telling us? Who has he been telling us we are? In the past three chapters, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, Paul doesn't tell us to do one single thing. He doesn't tell us to do anything in the first three chapters. He's constantly telling us who we are in Christ. I won't go through all of them, but he said things like, In Christ, you are a saint. And we looked at our sainthood in Christ. And I always think about when, when I think about our identity being a saint in Christ, I'm, my mind always goes back to when we preached that sermon several weeks ago, and on that particular day, we had found out that one of our sisters, Martha Brown, had gone to be with the Lord. And, and not too far from that, a few days before that, one of our brother saints, Dennis Oliver, had gone to be with the Lord. And I think about these saints and you know what the reality is, is they did not find their sainthood in their goodness. Their sainthood was founded in Christ. Just as our sainthood is founded in our relationship with Christ. I want you to do something with me for 10 seconds in silence. I want you to think of the people who have loved you into being. For 10 seconds, starting now. Maybe it's a saint that's gone on before us. Maybe it's a saint that is currently in your life right now. And what would your life be like today if that person or persons that you just thought about had not stepped into your life and showed you the love of Jesus Christ? And Paul goes on to to continue to paint this picture of our identity and, and who we are. And in chapter 2, he sums up the gospel in two words, two glorious words. He says, you know what? You were dead, D-E-A-D, -E dead in your transgressions, as Steve talked about in communion just a few moments ago. You were dead. And then the gospel summed up in two words. You know what it is in chapter 2? Go back and look at it. But God. But because of His great love, God, who is rich in mercy. You remember this language in chapter 2? What, is, what does He say? Let's go back and look at it. Just flip back to chapter 2 real quick and let's look at it. God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. I want you to think of the greatest seat that you've ever had. Maybe it's at a ball game, football game, or another sporting event. You say, man, I, we had great, great seats, 
It was right there on the such and such yard line, or it was right there in this. It was great seats, great seats. I want you to think of the greatest seat that you've had at a concert that you've gone to. Man, we had front row seats at this place. Front row! Woo! Maybe you think about your seat here in this room. I've been sitting in this room ever since you were in diapers, Sonny. Maybe, maybe that's the case. Maybe you have been. you got a great seat. Let me tell you something. It ain't your seat. It's not your seat. But let me give you some good news. you got a better seat. You and I in Christ, we are seated with Him in the heavenly realms. That's a good seat. That's a great seat. That's where you're seated. In Christ, that's where your students, that's where you're seated in Christ. That's a good seat. That's the seat that we want. And, and how much of this identity are we telling people? Well, we're at the corner of Lake Shore and Oxmoor, and we have the... This is our identity, church. And we're in an identity crisis as a culture. We're in an identity crisis as individuals. And this is the identity language that Paul is reminding us of. That in Christ we are saints. In Christ we are saved. In Christ we are reconciled. In Christ we are mystery sharers. And what a gift it is to share the mystery of Jesus Christ. In Christ we are gifted. In Christ we are all of these things. And this is the identity. When we talk about the new self, this is the new self. So how do you describe your church? How did you describe these things to other people? And if God's salvation is so good, remember what he said in verse 1 in chapter 4? If God's salvation is so good, then why don't we live like it? The problem is, is that we have a million dollar salvation and a five cent response. And if God's salvation, if God's grace is so good, then why have we cheapened that grace? Because the reality is, church, is that grace is not cheap, and grace without discipleship is cheap grace. It's cheap grace. And we want discipleship without discipline. And here's the reality. That doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in my life, and it doesn't exist in your life. And so when we begin thinking about this, that theology threaded through the brain is useless unless it gets to the heart. And look what he says in verse 19, as we just read, just back to chapter 4, in verse 19. He said, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. Our minds are given over to, to sports and movies and sitcoms to avoid thought. And our, our self-centeredness begins to alienate us from God. And here Paul is just giving this reminder. And I'm like, I, do, I wish this was not in here. And we identify, here's what we identify with, with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ by dying to self and rising to a new life. And as I heard one brother say just a few weeks ago, he said, my old being was drowned in baptism, but that rascal can swim. And so every day, we have to make this choice. We have to make this decision. And what I want us to spend a few minutes, our last few minutes with today, is just looking at some very practical ways some very practical things that we can do to dress for success this week. And I'm not talking about putting on nice, nice threads. I'm talking about clothing ourselves with Jesus Christ. So here's, here's a few things I want you to write down. Number one is to look to yourself first. Look to yourself first. Now the reason I say this this morning is because look at what Paul says. He says, I tell you this, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. And this, this quote, I like how this writer puts it. He said, we must be ruthlessly honest about our own selves. Pride and pleasure seek to dominate everything that we do, including our most religious acts. Pride and self-interest are wonderful instruments for putting 
out our eyes so that we never see the truth. We need to endure the pain of close self-analysis and tell the truth both to God and to ourselves about our pride and about our self-interest. That is called confession. There, I said it. It's called confession. And we confess to a God. Now, now for some of us, we're, we're sitting there thinking, well, man, come on, lunch is just so close. If we can just get through these last few minutes, you know, and, and man, I've got, it's such a beautiful day outside. I got to get to, and, and I want you to, I want you to stop. Stop and hear the word of the Lord. And when we stop and realize that, that our pride becomes this self-centeredness and and it owns us until we lay it aside. And until then, it continually consumes us. It says that they have lost all sensitivity. They've become callous. Now, kids, I do not want you to try this at home. I do not want a phone call from your parents saying, my little girl, I do not want that. So you kids, you are, this is a disclaimer, do not try this at home. But I want to ask you, how many of you have calluses on your hands from playing an instrument or working in the yard or working somewhere you got a callus somewhere on your hand you got you it's just there and, and Paul says they have lost all sensitivity and in the Eng, ESV says that they they have formed these calluses they have formed these calluses so that so that what so that they they do not feel they not feel the pain. Now, I've got this safety pin right here in my arm. I know, I know it's really small and you can't see it, but I actually have a callus on my thumb. I don't really know what it's from, but, but, but when you have all this pressure on one point, it forms this callus. And I can take this safety pin and I can stick it. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I can take it in this safety pin and I can stick it in my thumb. This is in my callus. And it's staying in there. You know what? I don't even feel it. No pain. Doesn't even hurt. It's just there. Are you, are you getting the illustration that Paul's saying here? That we form in life, we form these calluses. We, we form them in our own Christian lives and in our own walks. These prolonged pressure points that become calluses. And why do we need to remind Christians not to live like they used to? Because if we're honest with ourselves, there are things in our lives, there's things in your life, there are things in my life that we have to become, that we do become callous toward. And I'm not going to name all of them. You know what they are in your own life. You know what they are. You know what they are. It's not that God is okay with it. It's that we've formed calluses in those particular areas. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. How many of you thought that when you became a Christian that the war within your soul would just stop? I know I did. I thought that it would just stop. I thought that it would just cease. But, but this battle continues to rage within us. And we are oftentimes in this self-denial process police in Turtle Lake, Wisconsin, responded to a phone call years ago. John Bros had called the police claiming that he was robbed in the parking lot of a casino. But what John Bros didn't know is that the casino parking lot had surveillance cameras. And the police checked their surveillance tapes, hoping to identify the attackers, but instead the tape showed Bros banging his head against a light pole rubbing dirt in his face, walking back to his pickup, looking in the driver's side mirror, and returning to the same light pole and striking his head against the pole three or four more times. He then applied more gravel and dirt to his face, looked at his face in the mirror again, and then went into the casino to report the robbery. And all the while, doesn't know that he has been being recorded on these surveillance Cameras. And the truth is, what happened was that John Bros had lost all his money gambling and he wanted to make it look like someone had stolen all that money. Now, can you imagine seeing this unfold? If you're, if you're over in the other parking lot, because obviously none of y'all are at the casino, you're at the other parking lot, but you see this, you see this happening. You see this unfolding. 
This guy just banging his head up against the light pole, smearing gravel and dirt in his face. Why? Because he didn't want to look to himself first. He didn't want to look to himself first. And my friends, we have to look to ourselves first because sometimes as Christians, we do that. We want to blame everybody out there for our own refusal to deal with the old self in here. Number two is to learn to renew. Look what he says very quickly. We're going to run through these. He says, you, however, in verse 20, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Here it is, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Let me ask you this question. What are you doing daily to renew your minds? What are you doing daily to renew your minds? Paul talks about this same thing in Romans, about renewing our minds. And what what is it in your own life that you are, are doing? Part of worshiping God is loving Him with all of your mind. Most of us today are gonna take our cell phones. We're going to plug them into the wall. Either today sometime or or, or sometime tonight, you're going to plug your cell phone into the wall. Why? Because it needs to be recharged. It needs to be renewed. But how many times do we do this in our own life? How many times do we allow renewal? How many times do we allow that that our cord, that short little three-foot iPhone cord, how do we we allow that to plug into the wall in in our own lives? How do we renew our minds daily? And here's the the reality. You can change things that you do, but only Jesus can change who you are. And once Jesus changes who you are, then that should change what you do. Because when you know who you are, church, then you know what to do. This morning you changed your clothes. At least I hope you did. You had pajamas on when you got up this morning, and then you put on, you put on new clothes. Saw this one kid in the airport that had his pajamas on, and thought, "Well, that's cute." And I looked over, and his dad has pajamas on too, and said, "That's not cute." (laughs) Made me throw up in my mouth a little bit. But as you clothe yourself physically this week. I want you to remember, as you're clothing yourself physically this week, think about, think about this reality in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual life. That as you take off your pajamas every morning, as you put on your new clothes, remind yourself that spiritually you and I are clothed in Jesus Christ. So learn to renew that reality daily. And then lastly, is to live your baptism Live your baptism, verse 24, and to put on the new self, create it to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Martin Luther said, we daily return to our baptism. We continually put off the old being and we put on Christ. And in order to live out our baptism, we need to learn, hey, get, get this, we need to learn how to die. And we have that private funeral service every morning that we die to ourselves and that we live to Christ. And we live for Christ and we live from that identity in Christ. Remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, take the grave clothes off. You shouldn't dress like you're dead if you're alive in the power of God. And remember the the legion that Jesus healed that had all the demons and and Jesus sends all those demons into the pigs. And then how did they know that he was cured? When they saw legion in town, how did the townspeople know that he was cured? Go back and look at it in Luke 8. He was clothed and in his right mind. And this week, we have decisions Every day we're faced with that decision. Are we going to clothe ourselves supernaturally in Christ? Every day that's the decision that we face. And for some of you this morning you say, well, I've 
I've not put on, I've not put on the, the new clothes of Jesus Christ. I've, I've actually gotten far away from Jesus, or I've started to wander away from Jesus. And here's the good news this morning. Stay with me. Here's the good news this morning. If you have, if you have gotten away from Christ, if you have gotten away from Jesus, stop. Stop and turn around, and you'll realize he's not far away. So that's my prayer for all of us this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you are here today, I just want us to be real, real still for just a moment as we close. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I've, I've, gotten, I've gotten a little bit away from Jesus. And I, I need to stop and, and turn around and remind myself that he's right there and that I can, I can be clothed with him. If that's where you're at this morning, I, I just, I just want to pray over you. And I, I want our shepherds to just, just pray for you where they're sitting right now. And so if that's this, you this morning, will you just, with every head bowed and every eye closed, will you just raise your hand? Will you just raise your hand if that's where you are? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Anybody else? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you in the back. Okay, you can put your hands down. God, I'm just grateful that you give us the avenue of prayer. Father, that you allow us to come in this house of worship. And Father, I pray that we are and have been reminded of our identity in Christ. And Father, today... I pray for each hand and each person that, that said, you know what, I have gotten, I've gotten away from Jesus. I've gotten away from Christ. And I just pray today that you will meet them where they're at. Father, I pray that you will bless them in Jesus' name. I pray that you will work in their lives in a mighty way, whether it be something that they are struggling with uh, in a health condition, whether it be something they are struggling with financially, whether it be a, a, a sin that, that they are struggling with. Father, whatever it may be, may the family problems, uh, Father, uh, maybe it's, it's just the, the, the busyness of life that just sucks and drains so much out of us. Father, whatever it is, I pray that by your grace that you will allow Jesus to enter into their lives. And Father, we are reminded that every day we get up, we take off the old clothes and that we can put on the new. And that's our prayer today in Jesus' name and amen. We're so glad that you're here. If you need prayers of this church, we stand ready to pray with you. If you need to be baptized this morning, we invite you to do that. I'll be down front. There'll be a shepherd back here in room 113. Come as we stand and sing.